7. October and November days. On the 12th of October the Neue Rheinische Zeitung began to appear again and announced that Freilie Grot had joined its staff. It was fortunate enough to be able to welcome a new revolution immediately. For on the 6th of October the proletariat of Vienna had brought down its fist resoundingly and upset the treacherous plans of the Habsburg counter-revolution, which after Radetzky's victories in Italy intended, with the help of the Slav peoples, to crush first the rebellious Hungarians and then the rebellious Germans. Marx himself had been in Vienna from the 28th of August to the 7th of September in order to enlighten the masses there. But to judge from the occasional newspaper references he had not been particularly successful, and that is not surprising, for the workers of Vienna were still at a comparatively low level of development. The revolutionary instinct with which they had opposed the departure of the regiments ordered to Hungary to suppress the revolution there was therefore all the more praiseworthy. Their action drew the first fire of the counter-revolution upon themselves, a noble sacrifice of which the Hungarian aristocracy proved unworthy. It was anxious to wage its struggle for Hungarian independence on the basis of its historical rights, and the Hungarian army made only one half-hearted drive which increased rather than diminished the difficulties of the Vienna insurrectionaries. The attitude of the German democracy was no better, it certainly recognized how much depended for itself on the success of the Vienna insurrection. For if the counter-revolution gained the upper hand in the Austrian capital then it would inevitably deal the decisive blow in the Prussian capital also where it had been awaiting its opportunity, long enough. However, the German democracy contented itself with sentimental dirges, fruitless expressions of sympathy and vain appeals for aid to the impotent Rye regent. At the end of October the Democratic Congress met in Berlin for the second time and it issued an appeal on behalf of besieged Vienna drawn up by Ruhe. The Neue Rheinische Zeitung pointed out aptly that the appeal tried to make up for its lack of revolutionary energy by a sermonizing and tearful pathos, and that it contained not a vestige of revolutionary passion or ideas. On the other hand, the passionate appeals of Marx in powerful prose, and of Freilich Grot in magnificent verse, to afford the besieged Viennese the only effective assistance possible by overthrowing the counter-revolution at home, re-echoed like voices in the desert. Thus the fate of the Vienna Revolution was sealed, betrayed by the bourgeoisie and by the peasants and supported only by the students and a section of the petty bourgeoisie, the workers of Vienna fought heroically. But on the evening of the 31st of October the besieging troops succeeded in effecting an entry into the town and on the 1st of November the great black and yellow flag of the counter-revolution, waved from the steeple of St. Stephen's Cathedral. The moving tragedy in Vienna was quickly followed by a grotesque tragicomedy in Berlin. The Fool Ministry resigned to make way for the Brandenburg Ministry, which immediately ordered the assembly to retire to the provincial town of Brandenburg and caused General Vrongil to march into Berlin with the Guards regiments to support this order by force of arms. Brandenburg, an illegitimate Hohenzollern, compared himself somewhat too flatteringly with an elephant which would trample the revolution underfoot. But the Neue Rheinische Zeitung declared more truthfully that Brandenburg and his accomplice Vrongil were two men without heads, without hearts and without principles nothing more than imposing whiskers, but as such just the right opponents for the pusillanimous assembly, and in fact, Vrong Isle's martial whiskers proved sufficient to intimidate the assembly, it is true that it refused to vacate its constitutional seat, Berlin, but when one blow and one act of violence followed another, dissolution of the citizens' guard, the proclamation of martial law, etc. The assembly declared the ministers traitors and denounced them, to the public prosecutor. It ignored the demand of the Berlin workers that the rights of the people should be defended by force of arms and instead proclaimed passive resistance, or in other words, the noble decision to suffer the blows of the enemy without answering back. It was then driven out of one hall after the other by Vrong Isle's troops, and in a sudden burst of temperament caused by a new appearance of Vrong Isle's bayonets. It solemnly declared that the Brandenburg Ministry had no right to dispose of state monies or collect taxes so long as the Assembly was not permitted to hold its sessions in Berlin without let or hindrance. However, hardly had the Assembly been broken up than its president, von Unruh, fearing for the safety of his precious skin, called together the Bureau of the Assembly in order to place on record in the minutes that the decision against the Ministry was invalid on account of a technical formality. Although he had let the decision be made public without hindrance, it was left to the Neurina Zeitung to oppose the brutal coup of the government in a worthy fashion. It declared that the moment had arrived to oppose the counter-revolution with the second revolution, and it called on the masses to oppose the violence of the authorities with every possible form of counter-violence. 
passive resistance must have active resistance as its basis, it declared, otherwise it was nothing but the ineffective struggles of the sheep against the slaughter man. At the same time it ruthlessly demolished the legal quibbling about the theory of agreement with the crown, behind which the cowardice of the bourgeoisie sought to hide itself. The Prussian crown is absolutely within its rights when it acts as an absolutist power towards the assembly. And the assembly is in the wrong because it does not act towards the crown as a sovereign assembly. The old bureaucracy is unwilling to become the servant of the bourgeoisie whose despotic schoolmaster it has been up to the present, nor is the feudal party willing to sacrifice its privileges and its interests on the altar of the bourgeoisie. And finally, the crown sees its real and native social basis in the elements of the old feudal society, whose highest expression it is. Whilst it regards the bourgeoisie as a foreign and artificial basis which will support the crown only on condition that it withers away, the rousing by the grace of God becomes a sober legal title for the bourgeoisie, the right of blood becomes the right of paper, and the royal son a bourgeois farthing dip. The crown therefore refused to let itself be persuaded by the phrases of the bourgeoisie, but answered the half revolution of the latter with a whole counter revolution. It flung back the bourgeoisie into the arms of the revolution, into the arms of the people, when it shouted, Brandenburg in the assembly and the assembly in Brandenburg. The Neue Rheinische Zeitung aptly parodied this slogan as the guardroom in the assembly, and the assembly in the guardroom, expressing the hope that the people would be victorious under this slogan and turn it into the epitaph on the grave of the house of Brandenburg. After the decision of the Berlin Assembly to deprive the government of the right to collect taxes, the Democratic District Committee in Cologne issued an appeal on 18 November signed by Marx. Chapper and Schneider demanding that the democratic associations in the Rhineland should immediately take steps to put the following measures into effect. Any attempt made by the authorities to collect taxes by force should be resisted by every possible means, citizens' guards to be organized everywhere immediately to offer resistance to the enemy, arms and munitions to be supplied to the poor at municipal cost and by voluntary contributions. Should the government refuse to recognize and respect the decisions of the assembly then committees of public safety should be elected everywhere, if possible in agreement with the municipalities, those municipalities resisting the assembly to be re-elected by popular vote. Thus the democratic association did what the Berlin assembly should have done and must have done had it taken its decision to refuse the payment of tarts seriously. However, the heroes of the Berlin assembly trembled at their own courage and hurried off to their constituencies in order to prevent the carrying out of their decision. And after that they slunk off to Brandenburg to continue their sessions. With this the last vestige of dignity and influence had been abandoned so that on the 5th of December it was an easy matter for the government to dismiss the assembly altogether and to impose a new constitution and a new franchise. The treachery of the Berlin Assembly paralyzed the district committee in the Rhineland, which was flooded with troops. On the 22nd of November La Salle, who had enthusiastically welcomed the appeal, was arrested in Dusseldorf, whilst in Cologne the public prosecutor took action against those who had signed it, although he did not dare to arrest them. On the 8th of February the signatories to the appeal appeared before a jury in Cologne on a charge of having incited the people to armed resistance against the authorities and against the military forces of the crown. The attempt of the public prosecutor to use the laws of the 6th and 8th of April, the same laws which the government had trodden underfoot with its coup, against the assembly and against the accused was demolished by Marx in a powerful speech. Those who had carried out a successful revolution might logically hang their opponents, but not sit in judgment upon them. They might get rid of their defeated enemies, but not try them as criminals. It was cowardly hypocrisy to use the laws which a successful revolution or counter-revolution had just overthrown against those who had upheld them. The question of whether the assembly was in the right, or the crown, was a historical one and could be determined only by history and not by a jury. But Marx went still further, he refused to recognize the laws of the 6th and 8th of April at all, declaring them to have been manufactured by the United Diet in order to save the crown from having to admit its defeat in the March struggles. An assembly representing modern bourgeois society could not be judged according to the laws of a feudal body. The principle that society was based on law was a legal fiction. On the contrary, in reality law was based on society. In my hand is the code Napoleon, it did not produce bourgeois society, on the contrary, it was produced by bourgeois society, which, arising in the 18th century and continuing its development in the 19th, found no more than its legal expression in the code.
The moment the code failed to reflect social relations faithfully, it would be no more than a scrap of paper. You cannot make the old laws the basis of the new society any more than the old laws made the old society. The Berlin Assembly had failed to understand the historic role which had developed for it out of the March Revolution. The reproach of the public prosecutor that the Assembly had refused all mediation was baseless because the misfortune and the mistake of the Assembly lay precisely in the fact that it had degraded itself from a revolutionary convention into an ambiguous association of conciliators. What we have witnessed was not a political conflict between two fractions on the basis of one society, but a conflict between two societies, a social conflict in a political form. It was the struggle of the old feudal bureaucratic society against modern bourgeois society, the struggle between the society of free competition and the society of the guilds and corporations, between the society of land ownership and the society of industry, between the society of authoritarian belief and the society of knowledge. There could be no peace between these two societies, but only a struggle in which one of them must go under. The refusal to pay taxes did not shake the foundations of society, as the public prosecutor had amusingly contended. It was an act of self-defense on the part of society against a government which threatened its foundations. The assembly had not acted illegally with regard to its refusal to pay taxes, nor had it acted legally with its announcement of passive resistance. If the collection of taxes is declared illegal, it is my duty to oppose, by force if necessary, any attempt to carry out an illegal act. Although those who had proclaimed the refusal to pay taxes had refused to take the revolutionary path for fear of their own skins, the masses of the people were nevertheless compelled to do so when carrying out this proclamation. The attitude of the assembly was not decisive for the people, the assembly has no rights of its own, the people have merely transferred to the assembly the task of defending their rights. When the assembly fails to perform this task, its rights expire, and the people then appear in the arena in person to act in their own right. When the crown organizes a counter-revolution the people justly answer with a new revolution, Marx concluded his speech with the statement that only the first act in the drama had been played out. The final denouement would be the complete victory of the counter-revolution or a new and victorious revolution. Though perhaps that could be possible only after the completed victory of the counter-revolution. After this proud revolutionary speech the jury acquitted all the accused and the foreman of the jury thanked Marx for his instructive explanation.